Hello everyone, and today before we start, I wanted to just talk to you about something um, important. Uh, as a lot of you know, I live in the Northeast. I actually live very close to where the Lewiston, Maine mass shooting took place. Um, luckily myself, my family are okay. Uh, I do know people affected by it. Um, and the atmosphere around here was fairly crazy for the uh, last week or so, which is to be expected. Um, so on screen, I am putting a, a picture of the victims, the known victims at the time of recording this. Um, and in the description of the video, you can find a link to the Maine Community Foundation Lewiston Auburn Area Response Fund for Victims and Families. Um, if you are able to donate, uh, it, of course, if you can't, that's uh, totally fine. If you are able to donate, I, I please ask you that you consider it. Um, you know, this is a community where people don't expect things like this to happen. It's a very tight knit community. Of course, no one ever expects things like this to happen, nor should things like this happen. So uh, anything that people can give is uh, really a blessing and will be appreciated. Again, that is the Lewiston Auburn Area Response Fund for Victims and Families, and I will be leaving a link to that in the description. Thank you very much if you are able to donate. Um, I, myself and everybody obviously appreciate it and uh, enjoy the video. Boo! Dice scare you. Hello everyone, happy Halloween. I hope you've been treated more than you've been tricked this year. And if you've been tricked too much at least, I hope it was funny. Today we're going to talk about an anime that is considered a cult classic. Well, I could have picked something a little bit more brazenly horror inspired like Helsing or the underrated Shiki, I figured we could talk about something truly scary. The internet. Serial Experiments Lane is a 13 episode TV anime released in 1998, and despite being 25 years old at this point, its themes are still poignant and honestly anxiety inducing. The key creatives behind Lane were its co-producer, Yasuyuki Ueda, writer Chiaki Kanaka, and director Toyotaro Nakamura, with character designs by Yoshitoshi Abe, the man behind Welcome to the NHK. The way Triangle staff, specifically Ueda, approached creating Lane was pretty unique for its time. Ueda himself hoped that the show would create a discourse between Japanese and American fans about the themes of the show, an online cultural exchange that would bring the East and West closer together through conversation and new perspectives. Unfortunately, he found that American audiences had a very similar reaction to Japanese fans, though he always seems very appreciative that Lane has a wide appeal. Now, I find this to be pretty interesting, mainly because they were actually thinking about what Western audiences would actually think about their show. Lane was created in 1998, the same year that Pokemon would first be introduced to the West and air on TV in America. Anime was incredibly niche in the United States, especially for a psychological thriller like Serial Experiments Lane. So even the fact that they were interested in what Americans might think about the show is a pretty unique perspective. I would think that most production studios in Japan really wouldn't give a shit about what Westerners would think about their shows because a lot of the time they wouldn't even be aired. Before we move on, I want to mention that this video might be structured a little differently because Lane is told semi-non-linearly. This will be closer to a discussion on the themes and messages and less a breakdown of what happens from episode to episode. So with all that in mind, let's take a plunge into the dark and esoteric world of Serial Experiments Lane. <laughs> Thank you. 
At its core, Serial Experiments Lane is meant to be an interpretive anime. Its creators have said that there are many different messages that can be taken away, and a quick search of anime forums and reddit posts reveals that to be absolutely true. As such, what I end up thinking about the story could be totally different from what you get out of it, and really that's the intended purpose. There are people out there that cast Lane down as avant-garde trash, or a series whose entire purpose was to let RC creators put cryptic pen to paper. I really don't see it that way. To me, Serial Experiments Lane is a story about growth, change, and loneliness, but also about human connection and the importance of identity. I do think it's important to note that every episode, or layer as they're called in Lane, begins by reassuring the viewer that the events take place in the present day at the present time, accompanied by very reassuring manic laughter. Lane Iwakura is a pretty normal junior high student. She has an uninterested older sister, a dad who's a little too into his 8 monitor PC setup, and a group of friends that simultaneously stick up for her and pick on her. Lane is fairly introverted and unremarkable, and even at the start of the series, we see how closed off to other people she can be. When Lane talks, it's usually not much more than a mumble, and the only clothing we see her wear is her school uniform, something that helps her blend in but takes away individuality, and a pair of hooded bear pajamas, something we see her wear when she needs comfort from stressful situations, or even just to deal with her family. Despite the normal challenges of school, life is pretty mundane for Lane, until one day when a girl from a nearby high school jumps off a building. Soon after, students from the surrounding area begin getting email from the deceased girl, and this pushes Lane to begin pursuing knowledge through the series stand-in for the internet, and esoteric and almost ethereal sub-realm called The Wired. Think of The Wired as a Discord server from 1999, a swirling black void of information that can be incredibly terrifying or enticing. So basically Lane predicted Twitter. While I poke fun, the depiction of the internet in Serial Experiments Lane is way ahead of its time. There are aspects of the metaverse in there, and the way that the show depicts hooking up to the wired leaves you wondering if the characters are really apparating in cyberspace, or if it's just an artistic representation of them sitting at their PC. One thing that Lane loves to do throughout its 13 episode runtime is include these vignettes from other characters throughout the world. At first they seem like they are just world building, but it is actually really impressive how they tie back into the overall plot. We see a guy buy a type of cyber drug called Excella, an ingestible chip that causes your brain to go into overdrive. While heading to school, Lane sees this really creepy dude just staring at her with these cold blue eyes. The sense of anxiety that she feels is only heightened by the ever-present humming of the suspended power lines. The shadows in Lane are always incredibly dark and appear to be splotched with deep reds and serve as a representation of how the wired is always waiting just under the surface. This is where the high strangeness of the show really begins to pick up. Episode 1 is unsettling and characters like Lane's mom seem a little strange, but overall it's, it's nothing that crazy. Episode 2, on the other hand, is where you start to realize that Lane is going to take you for a ride, and you can either try to scramble and make sense of everything, or just let it happen to you. Lane's friends ask her if she was at the nightclub Siberia last night, a weird question since she's like 14, but in the hyper-techno world of serial experiments, Lane, teenagers being served at a nightclub is commonplace. It was one of the first things that I found a little unsettling, and the show doesn't really explain why society is this way, why the parents don't really seem to care that their children are going out alone. Apparently, the lane that was at Siberia was wearing wild clothes and didn't take any shit from anybody, basically the polar opposite of the mouse-like schoolgirl that we've been following. Lane's friends invite her out to the club that evening to try and get her out of her shell, but first she goes home to find her newly ordered Navi being delivered. 
the email from a ghost, along with an incredibly cryptic blackboard message telling her to come to the Wired, has intrigued her enough that her father orders her a top-of-the-line Navi. She even asks him to set it up for her before dinner, and how could you say no to that blank, expressionless stare? Lane is pulled away from her intro to the virtual world by text from Alice and goes out to meet with them. The guy from the beginning of the episode that is tripping his balls off on Excella sees Lane and freaks the fuck out, screaming that the wired and real world have to remain separate at all costs. He pulls a gun and starts shooting, but freezes when Lane approaches him. Suddenly she seems much more mature, cold even, as she tells him that in the wired everyone is connected no matter where they are. This shocks the man so much that he puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger, leaving us with an image of a blood-splattered lane, and the question of who this girl, the one who can casually walk up to a crazed gunman, really is. Lane is taken to the police station and questioned, but totally clams up. Lane dissociating in this moment is a pretty reasonable response to that sort of trauma, and it reinforces how nihilistic Lane's world is when the only person who asks if she's okay is her friend Alice. More to the point, when she gets home, no one is there and she finds the house completely empty. Even when she does try to talk to her mom about the incident the next morning, her mom is so dismissive and uninterested in her that she doesn't even bother finishing her sentence. And so the feeling that something isn't quite right with Lane's parents begins to set in. As Lane heads to school, she notices a strange black car parked near her house and hears a disembodied voice on the bus telling her that she isn't alone. The voice seems to be in her ear throughout the school day, giving a deep lecture on the nature of the human psyche and other metaphysical concepts. The voice of Chiso once again tells her there is no point in staying in the physical world, and this is where I really start to feel an acute sense of anxiety with this show. Not only does the ambient soundtrack of Lane contain a buffet of low droning hums, it tends to take long zoom-ins of characters' faces, and conversations often feature long, frustrating pauses. The world of Lane varies between the overexposed white void of reality that only feels more empty as time goes on, and the perplexing vortex of the wired. Honestly, with everything going on this month, I may have put Lane down around episode 5 if it hadn't been for this video, and now I'm glad I didn't do that because I think that this show is a piece of art in its own right, but as someone who already has anxiety, this show does a really good job of instilling the existential dread of an oncoming panic attack. So, uh, yeah, if you're having a really bad week, maybe don't watch Lane right before you go to bed. On the other hand, I did watch about half of this show while sleep deprived, and I think it may have actually elevated the experience. Uh, use your own discretion. Lane finds a mysterious computer chip in her locker. No one seems to know what this thing is or where it came from, and when she asks her father if he has any idea what it is, he just says no and immediately leaves the room. At the club, the DJ, a guy named JJ, seems to recognize Lane and know her by name, though he remarks that she looks quite childish tonight. Another clue that someone who looks a lot like Lane must have been seen around. Lane thinks that someone at Siberia may know what the chip is. She meets a kid named Taro who tells her that it's a chip that could give Lane full access to the wired if she installed it in her Navi. A psyche chip is exceptionally rare, and apparently in the world of Lane, you learn how to modify a Navi in class by like 8th grade, something that Lane has no idea about. Lane's sister Mika walks in on her installing the chip in her underwear because according to her, she's avoiding static electricity, and then she smiles and welcomes Mika home while her face glitches and the episode ends. This is something that Serial Experiments Lane loves to do. Most episodes end on a pretty surreal cliffhanger, and very rarely do those cliffhangers get a concrete explanation at the beginning of the next episode. It really helps the otherworldly vibe that this show gives off, and it makes it so the viewer has no idea what to expect in those final moments. This isn't restricted to just cliffhangers either. The further you get into Lane, the more frequent these randomly interjected scenes become. 
Lane seems to open up to her friends more as the series goes, telling them that she heard about a high schooler committing suicide in The Wired. Apparently there have been some deaths connected to an online game called Phantoma. One guy thinks that he's being stalked by a monster in the online game, only to accidentally kill a small child, and the grip that The Wired has on the citizenry of the world seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Lane is seen observing this scene as a ghostly phantasm, representing her ability to see things from within the Wired. JJ emails her and tells her that the murders in Phantoma were the byproduct of the game connecting with a children's online game through a back door. It is suspected that the group responsible for this is a mysterious cabal of hackers known only as the Knights. Lane's father tries to warn her not to get too drawn in to the online world of the Wired, not to neglect her life in the real world, but Lane says the barrier between the Wired and the real world isn't as defined as he thinks, and soon she'll be able to fully enter it. The creepy black car shows up outside Lane's house, and when she yells at the G-Men to leave her alone, it literally blows one of their pairs of glasses off. Episode 5 introduces us to the theory that Lane's world is nothing but a simulation, a different layer of the Wired's multi-tier existence. Lane hears a disembodied voice that tells her that humans are worthless, they have stopped evolving, but now they have the ability to shed their flesh and enter the Wired. The voice tells Lane that it is God. The episode goes on to intersperse scenes of Lane talking with different objects in her room. It appears to be a flashback as her Navi isn't taking over her bedroom, though they talk about events that happen after she assembles it, so it is what it is. Lane talks to these objects and eventually her floating parents about prophecy. It's here where I think it's a little natural to start getting a little frustrated if you're trying to piece together the story. Let me tell you, it's sort of an exercise in futility because until the final episodes when all the pieces start to come together, it really makes very little sense. Scenes sometimes happen out of order, characters talk in unnatural ways, layouts of rooms change from moment to moment, and while there's a theme of government conspiracy and pre-apocalyptic doomsaying that is ever-present, that stuff is never really the focus. Many say that watching Serial Experiments Lane is really an exercise in feeling how Lane feels through abstract visuals and very little exposition. And while I appreciate the more artsy parts of this show, I do understand why people might drop it after episode 4 or 5. Lane is a show that lets the questions flow freely, but is incredibly tight-lipped when it comes to giving the answers, and I will say it does expect the viewer to put in work to understand what's going on. I think that the end of episode 5 is where I fully bought into the simulation theory idea for the first time. Lane's sister Mika goes through a harrowing event where she experiences lost time after seeing Lane standing in traffic. When she returns home, she comes face to face with herself, then the Mika that we know is gone, though Lane sees a ghostly image of her fade into nothingness, and Mika tells her not to worry about it and walks off. Lane's father is shocked to see her Navi now covers up her entire room, like all traces of Lane's individuality have been covered up by who she is in the Wired. Side note, I definitely thought that he knocked over a piss jug when he entered, but apparently it's just coolant. At this point, Lane has been leading a sort of double life, beyond the mystery of the more adult-like Lane at the nightclub. In The Wired, Lane has made a name for herself, to the point where she has contact with members of the Knights on one of their private sites. For what it's worth, Lane's progression from someone who has no idea what email even is, to well-known Wired denizen isn't exactly rushed, but it does feel surreal since we never really see it. To me, it kind of goes to illustrate how someone can be a totally different person online than they are in real life, saying things that they would never dream of in person. Children from all around the town have begun staring up at the sky like they're praising the sun, a strange epidemic that no one can explain. The clouds open up, revealing a huge vision of Lane, and then disappear just as fast. 
The children staring up at it with open arms, all the talk of prophecy and God, the story feels biblical at times, and it's an interesting combination with the cyberpunk influence. Lane is still investigating the various murders and strange occurrences within the Wired, and is led to a man named Dr. Hodgson. Hodgson is a scientist responsible for a research program 15 years ago that attempted to harness the latent psychic energy within children. This program, called KIDS, went terribly wrong and killed all the test subjects when it overloaded. Hodgson says he destroyed the data, but some of it must have leaked into the Wired, and the game that's been causing the murders is the result of his data being used. Lane feels used by the Knights, believing them to be behind the kids' incidents. She laughs at them and calls them losers, but then realizes that these strange agents are back outside her house. She goes outside and confronts them, asking them if they're the Knights. Just then her Navi explodes, and the men explain that someone sabotaged her system, but it wasn't them. And they get in their car and drive away. Lane isn't rid of them for very long, however, as they show up the next day and ask her to come with them. They take her to an office labeled Tachibana General Labs, where she meets an older gentleman and helps him get his navi past the office firewall. Once she does this, the screen shows communications from this weird tech hobo guy that's been stumbling around the city with an Oculus Rift on his head. He's pleading to join the knights, and there's a Lane there rebuking him and calling him an idiot. Lane, in the real world, flips out and asks them and who they are. Are they the Knights? Are they from this Tachibana Labs? They refuse to answer and give her a question instead. How well does she know her parents, her sister? As he grills her about her past, Lane switches to her more serious, adult personality and tells him to shut up. He says the barrier between the Wired and the real world is beginning to crumble, something that Lane apparently thinks sounds very interesting. Lane's identity crisis goes into full swing after this, with her telling her parents that someone asked her if she was really their daughter, and they literally just stare at her without saying anything, and it's incredibly creepy. When Lane arrives at school, everyone seems mad at her, and her friends just ask her if she did it, which is a, a really frustrating way to write a conversation since we don't know what they're talking about, but before anyone can explain, they're distracted and run off to class. Lane talks to God in The Wired, and he straight up tells her that her body is nothing more than a hologram, and that she's always existed in The Wired. Lane immediately rebukes this, but the identity crisis that she's been suffering since her experience at Tachibana Labs is beginning to take hold. While the world begins to fade away around her, Lane finally understands why everybody is mad at her. It turns out that Alice fantasizes about her teacher, and Lane is being blamed for spreading a rumor about that throughout the Wired. Lane tries to kill her other self, but it's ultimately something she cannot run from. You hear that comment section? You all better be nice to me or you're gonna have to strangle your own clone in a dream. Lane is told that she's omnipresent in the wire, that she and God are one and the same, and that's how she knew Alice's secret. Lane surmises that if this is true, she should be able to change or delete people's memories since they're just information. The show's theory that the Wired truly can't interfere with the real world because the brain's functions come down to different electrical signals being fired is pretty interesting, and one that got me thinking about it while watching, like, damn, could that happen in real life? Not gonna lie, this show got me pretty introspective. Anyway, Lane is able to delete her friend's memories, but she observes a copy of herself go off with them and be happy, further compounding her identity crisis. But now instead of asking who is Lane, maybe we should be asking what is Lane? More important question, who the fuck is this little gray alien in a Freddy Krueger sweater that walks into Lane's room like he owns the damn place? He doesn't pay rent, get out of here. So this episode is interspersed with a documentary about Roswell, conspiracy, and the development of The Wired. It includes real-world people like Vannevar Bush, alongside the Majestic 12, Roswell UFO crash, and other conspiratorial classics. I believe that the team's intention here was to show how conspiracy, both in real life and in the world of Lane, can go on to influence thinking and technical evolution. There's talk of the world 
world's population equaling the amount of neurons present in the brain and humanity speeding towards one huge wireless network where everyone is connected. The new seventh generation of the Wired Protocol is said to be able to achieve this connectedness because of something called Schumann Resonance. Schumann Resonance is a real thing and is essentially peaks in electromagnetic activity at an extremely low frequency in the Earth's ionosphere. Yes, this will be on the test. So the new wired protocol being able to connect people to it wirelessly through Schumann resonance affecting the brain's neurons is my basic understanding of the underlying conspiracy plot of Serial Experiments Lane. This is something that was inserted covertly into the new protocols by a scientist named Ieri Masami, who was then fired by his employers and found dead a few days later. Who were his employers? Uh, none other than Tachibana General Labs. Lane grills Taro, the kid who told her about the Psyche chip, about another component that she received from Siberia. It's a chip once again, but this time it has the Knight's logo imprinted on it. Taro tells her that the chip overwrites existing memories with artificial ones, but he isn't the one responsible for the other Lane, and is only loosely affiliated with the Knight's. This freak appears outside Lane's house, and I can't help but notice that he has Yeri's face. This is because he is God, the transferred emotions and memories of Yeri Masami, his digital soul uploaded into the Wired. They have a conversation where the voices are coming out of the wrong characters, and God tells Lane that she does not need a body. She should shed her flesh and ascend to the Wired where she belongs. Lane's grip on reality begins to dissolve. Her desk at school isn't even there, and no one seems to notice her. When she returns home, her family is gone once again, and it appears they left in a hurry. As she picks up the room, her father appears behind her and tells her that she must realize that their work is done here. Lane begs him not to leave her alone, and he tells her that in The Wired, she never will be alone, and that despite the fact that this was just a job to him, he did come to love her. The sky above Lane appears to be a circuit board, further cementing the feeling that this reality is just a simulation. Lane decides that the god of The Wired is only a god because he has believers, the Knights. She uses her powers online to publish a list of all the known Knights members, causing them all to either kill themselves or be taken out by the men in black, who we now believe to be working for Tachibana. Tachibana is working to stop the Knights, whose goal is to merge reality in the Wired, and they've already begun to scrub the 7th gen protocols of any trace of Yeri's programs. This should cause the Wired to go back to being a subsystem of the real world, instead of a separate world in its own right. At least they hope so. God does reveal to Lane that he still has one follower, one person that believes in him, and so he still has power. And that person is her. He again tells her that she was born in the Wired. Her friends and family and relationships are all artificial, but she refuses to believe it, causing the power lines above her house to explode. Lane's powers in the Wired begin to manifest in the real world more and more. Episode 11 is pretty trippy. It's almost like a music video. Lane immerses herself in the Wired and replays the events of the past few weeks while trying to find answers about who she is. Ieri appears and realizes that Lane has loaded an emulation of her Navi into her own brain, and the information has begun to overflow. Finally, Ieri tells Lane the truth of who she is. Lane is a software program. All this time, she's been worrying that she was a machine when she was really an executable file given a body by Ieri. Lane meets both Chisa and the shooter from Siberia outside, and like an angel and devil on her shoulder, they argue whether or not she should still have a body. This seems to be all part of Ares' master plan, as Lane's suicide would apparently destroy the barrier completely. Alice is still being troubled by the rumors about her when the gray alien from a few episodes ago sneaks into her room, but now it has Lane's head. It tells her that it was not the one spreading the rumors, but it knows that Alice will never believe her, so it's taken down the barrier and can now fix everything. Yeah, this, uh, this part fried my brain a little bit, so if you know what's up with the alien, like, <laughs>
go ahead and tell me in the comments. Uh, the best I can come up with is like the alien is a representation of what humans consider higher intelligence. So that's what Lane sees observing her because that's in her head mentally what she would think of a higher intelligence to be. I don't know. It, it's 3 a.m. the next day at school. It seems that everyone has forgotten about the rumors except for Alice. When Lane shows up, everything else seems to fade away, and Lane is the only character that gets a blood pool shadow in this segment, showing that she has become one with the Wired. The MIB agents discuss why the barrier is crumbling even though they completed their objective of destroying the Knights. Blue Eyes thinks that Ieri is still alive and out there, in fact he may even be behind everything. The older guy from Tachibana shows up and gives them payment, it turns out he was working to destroy the barrier the whole time, not stop them, and use the MIB agents to complete his objective. He tells them to go somewhere with no power lines or GPS coverage, but before they can leave they both see a ghostly apparition of Lane and convulse until they die. Alice goes to Lane's house to confront her, only to find it all messed up and full of Silent Hill mist. Oh yeah, Mika is still here and since she faded away early in the series, she's basically been a zombie that makes beeping sounds like a phone. She makes her way to Lane's room and finds her under a pile of wires. She asks Lane why she erased everyone else's memories but left hers intact. Alice wonders why she has to relive these terrible visions and Lane admits it's because Alice is her only friend and that Lane loves her. She tells Alice that she's nothing but a program designed to destroy the barrier and everyone else is just an application. Alice tells Lane she's wrong, they're alive, and places Lane's hand on her chest, showing her that her heart is beating. She's more than just information. This seems to bring Lane back to reality a bit, and then Ieri shows up and tells Lane that if she really loved Alice, she would connect with her. Lane asks Ieri what gives him the right to do the things that he does, and he says it's because he's omnipotent. But who gave Eri the right to do it? This makes the God of the Wired really angry, as he thinks that Lane is saying that his intelligence and ability to control the Wired must come from a power higher than his. Eri is nothing but a stand-in God, a being that only has power inside of the realm of the Wired. He himself says that God has always existed, but if he cannot exist without the Wired, then how could he be God before the Wired was invented, and if God was always there, then that don't make no sense. His plan to destroy the barrier completely and bring the two worlds together is really nothing but a desperate gambit to gain power, but an omnipotent being who has seemingly always existed wouldn't need to do that. This logic pisses Ieri off so much that he starts to manifest into the real world as a gross, fleshy monster that Lane disposes of by burying him in computer parts. Alice is left so shocked by this event that she's completely hysterical and pushes Lane away. Lane hugs her and realizes that every time she tries to help Alice, she just ends up hurting her. This moment is when Lane seems to make her final decision. The next scene is pretty mundane, Lane's parents and sister having a fairly normal conversation at dinner. Her father looks at the empty chair where Lane would sit, seems to notice something is amiss, but then shrugs it off. People throughout Lane's life go about their day pretty normally, everything seems fairly upbeat, even Chisa is alive. The episode then restarts, and we see the image of the real world Lane crying alone in a city. Wired Lane begins to argue with her, telling her to stop crying because deleting herself was what she wanted. They argue about staying within the Wired, and it seems that Lane has the ability to do a time loop and restart everything. Lane has abilities and powers now that only really make sense if the entire world of Lane is a simulation. And that theory is backed up by some fourth wall breaks throughout the series, such as Lane directly asking the viewer who she is. And if we think of Lane's world as a world that is a simulation because it's inside an anime, and we are existing and observing that simulation by watching the show, well, 
it all starts to make my brain swirl and I, I start to go into Cognito Hazard. The sky opens up, revealing the face of Lane's father looking down. He brings her to a table up in the sky and tells her that she can admit to herself that she loves those people even if she's apart from them. Lane cries and her father says that, you know, they should do this again sometime as the time loop of events resets. So I'm not even entirely sure what I think of this scene. My gut reaction is to believe that Lane's father is a representation of the real God guiding Lane through the ending of her simulation. However, Lane is now known to be the God of this realm. So why would there be a being above her? Well, if you take Lane as a program, perhaps the simulation is a learning experience for her, and her time with those around her has caused her to see this fatherly mentor figure as God. Since she has omnipotent powers at this point, and she can create the things she needs to guide her forward to tell her that it will be okay, it's a bittersweet thought, as is the entire ending of this show. Years later, we see Alice walking with her partner in a world that is pretty similar to our own. And in fact, this is probably the first time in the series where the world doesn't feel completely empty. Alice sees a little girl that looks just like Lane watching them from a bridge and goes to talk to her, thinking that she might know her from somewhere. The girl introduces herself as Lane and Alice has no memory of her, just a sense of deja vu. The two part, saying goodbye to each other, and Lane watches Alice walk away, smiling from afar. Lane's choice in the end was to stay in the Wired as the god of her world, guiding and protecting those she loves from a distance. Like I said, bittersweet ending. Lane decided to delete herself and rejoin the Wired in order to make life better for everyone else. However, she also still has her sense of self. And maybe in the end, the point of all that Lane went through was for her as a program to understand what humanity is. We know that she rebukes the version of herself that is fully immersed in the Wired. She has a choice to go back to being just Data multiple times, and in the end, the love that she felt for other people was strong enough that she kept that and incorporated it into herself. So that was my understanding and thoughts on the cult classic Serial Experiments Lane. And to be fair, that's only my interpretation and feelings about the series. Like I said at the start of this video, this is meant to be an interpretive anime, so you could have a totally different takeaway than I did. Hell, I could see someone watching this show and just seeing everything as an allegory for a young girl being depressed and going through the stages of wondering if everyone would be better off without them, no matter how depressing that seems. No matter how you take it, I think that Lane is a beautiful show. The art is immaculate, disturbing, and anxiety-inducing. Of course, I've only seen this show one time, and there are people that say your opinion will change on the second or third viewing, and I can totally see why. I'm actually pretty happy with my viewing experience with this show, and I feel like I took a lot away from it. There is tense and thrilling political intrigue that always is happening in the background, layers and layers of conspiracy that compounds upon the general atmosphere of anxiety and high strangeness. That being said, if you are susceptible to being crippled by existential dread, uh, maybe skip this one. But yes, I absolutely do recommend Serial Experiments Lane, and I'm really glad that I made a video on it, because all these thoughts could not be kept inside. If you've seen Lane and have a different interpretation of the events, as I'm sure a lot of people do, please go down into the comments and tell me about it, because like fostering conversation was the entire point in the first place, wasn't it? Thank you all for watching tonight, and uh, I will see you all again very soon. Hey everyone, welcome to today's end card. Let's start, as always, by thanking the channel members, aka Batosai, Argent Griever, Ashar Kazar, Brian Sanchez, D. Mels, Daniel Johnson, Detter V. Gert. Joe Castellanos, Joe Cavazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean, Nugent, Mr. Smash, Trey Hardy, Zappa Slave, and Video Gamer 75. Thank you all so much for being channel members. I appreciate you all. You're all, you're all my special little boys. Okay. Anyway, 
yeah, thank you for watching this one. This was a really weird one to do. Uh, Lane was one that kind of kept me up at night. It gave me a lot of anxiety, but like kind of in a good way. It's, it's really hard to explain. Um, especially right now where I'm like sleep deprived trying to get this video out before Halloween. So uh, as of the time of recording, that shouldn't be a problem and this should be out barring any like copyright issues. So I hope there's not. Anyway, next up is going to be Gundam Age. Uh, I have most of that script written, so it shouldn't be too long. A lot to say about that. And then afterwards, I think we're going to check out Gasaraki or maybe something else a little bit shorter just to give myself a, a little break from the 50 episode stuff like Gundam Age. Anyway, thank you again. I hope you enjoyed and, uh, you know, enjoy your, your tricks and your treats. Happy Halloween, and we will see you next time.